Thank you for my fan club. <laughs> so uh, we have a great panel this afternoon. And it, our job is to keep you awake after a fabulous lunch. And that is never an easy thing to do when the food has been so good. Uh, the way we are going to proceed this afternoon is I'm going to ask our panelists to come up. Uh, I will then be uh, making a short presentation based upon uh, some of the data that we've been uh, seeing uh, that's looking at the growth of data across the uh, uh, global internet and broadband. And then we will have a panel discussion uh, focusing on a range of issues, including convergence, but not exclusive to, to convergence. So if I could ask the, or the, the panelists uh, to, to come up, we have Marcin Singer, who is Regional Managing Director for Effective Measure. Uh, Effective Measure is a company that looks and tr at, at consumer behavior. Um, this raises some of the issues raised earlier about, uh, which maybe we can have a conversation about some of the, the uh, privacy questions. Um, Renee Summer, a, a colleague I work with very closely on policy and regulatory issues in Europe. Uh, Renee is with Ericsson, uh, leading the uh, Ericsson's policy regulatory activities, uh, especially uh, in Europe. Um, Mohamed uh, al Sabia from uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, Mohammed focuses on the new media activities at Al Jazeera. So this is all about convergence. So you're living convergence. Jay uh, Bargava. I hope I didn't completely. Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, Jay is with Booz. Uh, Jay is the principal for media and entertainment and really understands this market. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, data and the trends, uh, also on convergence questions. Brahim uh, Grahibi from Alcatel-Lucent, another uh, colleague from the technology industry. Uh, and of course, he's, the, he's leading government and public affairs uh, activities for Middle East and Africa for Alcatel. Uh, and as the regional lead on all of these issues, has a really good understanding of the policy questions and what's needed to enable uh, broadband development and adoption. Uh, and finally, um, an old friend, uh, Nick Dent, who is the Group Chief Officer for New Business at Ordu. Um, and Nick has been part of the executive management team at Ordu leading all kinds of uh, activities on digital efforts and creation of new business. And so the new business activities uh, also uh, are uh, really focusing on uh, some of the convergence. So do I push this to come up with the first slide from my presentation? Press one, oop, oh, I'm gonna go back. The first thing I want to talk about, however, um, is a report that we did um, jointly with the UN Broadband Commission. Uh, Dr. Hesse and I uh, are on the commission together, and we're privileged, I'm privileged to, to do that with Dr. Hesse. Um, and uh, in, in July, uh, we released a report that uh, I did with the UN Broadband Commission team, um, the uh, economists at the ITU, and we actually asked a question that usually is never asked. Um, most people in public life only ask questions for which they know the answers, right? And when I was a government official, we were always nervous about asking questions that we didn't know the answers, although Blair Levin, who I um, worked for at the FCC, was always pushing and actually really good about asking those questions. We asked the question, does having a broadband plan actually make a difference? Does it matter? And the short answer is yes. We had four basic takeaways. 
The first is having a plan actually can increase broadband adoption by 25% over baseline for fixed and 30% uh, increase in, in broadband adoption for mobile, uh, mobile broadband. Second takeaway, competition matters. If we look at, especially in the mobile world, the difference between monopoly and competition can double, can double mobile broadband adoption. Third takeaway, um, public-private partnerships are the most effective way for developing deploy and deploying broadband plans. Why? Government by itself doesn't really, are not really the experts on the technology. In most places, it's the private sector that makes the investment. But if you leave it purely to the market, there will be gaps that will never be filled. So the role for government is to set out a vision, to set the framework, to create an, the, the environment for the private sector investment, deployment, service offerings, and then provide the backstop when there are gaps that need to be filled, including things like universal service connecting schools, the public um, e-government applications, the, ty the types of things that are exactly in the broadband plan that is being launched today. The fourth takeaway goes to Blair's point this morning, and Richard raised it as well, and that is broadband plans need to be regularly reviewed and refreshed. We found that the average broadband plan um, it was over seven years old. In this industry, seven years is 14 generations of technology. Right? It's not static, it's dynamic. So it really is a world in which the broadband plan has always to be in beta and constantly reviewed in this dynamic world. And that's exactly, Dr. Hesse, one of the recommendations that you have. So maybe you actually read the report before, you know, a report as you did yours. So I wanted to make that point first. Why is a broadband plan so important? What are some of the key components? And congratulations, because the plan here incorporates some of those very key elements. So this is a roadmap for success. Some key trends and drivers, I'm taking the data from our visual networking index study, which is a five-year rolling forecast of data and data consumption and patterns of data consumption. And we've been doing this now for seven years, so we actually go back and check, and I'll show you that in a minute. Top line, overall, globally, we're seeing uh, internet protocol traffic over a five-year period from 2012 to 2017 grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 23%. And that's leading us to the zettabyte error, right? Richard talked about exabytes. We're moving into a zettabyte era. What's a zettabyte? A zettabyte is 10 to the 21st, and exabytes only 10 to the 18th. All right. Big numbers. But what does that mean? We're forecasting that in 2017, 1.4 zettabytes of traffic will cross the global internet, the global IP networks. Putting that into context and perspective, if you take all of the traffic for the history of the internet from the beginning through last year, that was only 1.2 zettabytes. One year, five years from now, four years from now, more traffic is going to flow across the global networks than the entire history of the, of the internet today, cumulatively. In this region, we're not looking at 23% compounded annual growth rate, but 38% compounded annual growth rate. And in mobile, we're looking at a 77% compounded annual growth rate in this region. Mobile data traffic is increasing, will increase in this region by 17 times over the next five years. Question, right? Do we, do we make up these numbers? No, we actually have models, and they're very dynamic models. We go back and check. So in 2009, we for, this is the forecast we had for... Um, uh, IP traffic in uh, 2012. Um, blue was the, for, oh, I'm sorry, green was the forecast, 
and blue is the actual. Um, so this is actually what, um, uh, so it's very close. So we're very confident. Key drivers and trends, I will focus on three. There are actually four drivers that are driving demand. More people connected, more devices. The applications are richer and more, more bandwidth um, intensive. And fourth, the networks, in fact, get more robust or faster. So that uh, drives consumption. I'm going to talk about three. More devices, and each device is more data hungry, video, and cloud. If we look at the global trend in connected devices, by 2017, machine-to-machine -machine devices and handsets, and basically smartphones, um, although handsets all, but combined will have 73% of the device share. The fastest growing categories are not voice phones, it's smartphones and machine-to-machine -machine devices. But not all devices are created equal. If you look here, in 2012, last year, right, your average non-smartphone consumed 19 megabits per month. A smartphone, 342 mega, I'm sorry, these are megabytes per month. A 4G smartphone, four times a 3G smartphone at 1.3 gigabytes and then tablets and laptops. The biggest variable, the processor speed and the form factor, the resolution on the screen. But what's interesting is if you go forward five years, a smartphone today that's consuming 300 megabytes is gonna consume 2.6 gigabytes. And if you look at a 4G smartphone, a tablet, and a laptop, they're essentially gonna be consuming the same amounts of data on average five gigabytes per month per device and people are gonna have more devices. Now I know that this room is not average, but how many people here have smartphones? All right, of those of you who have your hands raised, how many people also have tablets? How many people also have a laptop that's connected with Wi-Fi, right? So right there, it's three devices. And if you think about each of those devices consuming five gigabytes per month, you can see where this is going. In this region, Mobile device growth is growing, right? Smartphones will reach, for the device, 19% share of the devices. You're still gonna have in the region a lot of GSM phones. That's not relevant. What's relevant is this, right? The 18-19% the, um, of the devices, the smartphones, will be consuming 71% of the data. Not all devices are created equal. And as we have more of these smartphones out there, these are the things that are going to be important in terms of what the, the profile for the data consumption and data generation is. By the way, when we come to 2022 here, your normal Traffic pattern is asymmetric. I download more than I upload. There's one major exception to that, which we already see in sports stadiums everywhere in the world. At a sports stadium, it's reversed. There's more traffic going upstream than downstream. People are taking their smartphones, they're doing videos and pictures, and they're uploading them. So the network that you configure for FIFA is gonna to have to be a completely different upside down architecture from what we do today on the average, or even in 2022 on the average basis. Some really interesting implications for the networks and the architectures. Video. Video is the new prime time medium. Why do I say that? First, in this region, IP video will account for 70% of the traffic across the networks by 2017. In mobile, it's going to be even more. 72% of data traffic will be video. The smartphone, the tablet, 
the laptop. And last year, what we did was, you know, we've been doing this for seven years. We've been looking at average data consumption. Last year, this year, rather earlier this year, when we looked at this, we decided, let's take a look at peak versus average. And guess what? Today, peak hour traffic is two and a half times greater than average hour traffic. In five years, it's going to be over three times average hour. And peak hour is 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. It's going to be um, the next prime time medium. And Al Jazeera is taking advantage of that, and we're going to hear a little bit about that, and Urdu is having to cope with over-the-top video in that context. And you can see that the busy hour is growing at a 29% compounded annual growth rate, where the average hour is only growing at 24%. So the gap between average and busy is growing even larger. Cloud. We need networks fit for purpose for cloud, because not all applications have the same requirements. Not all bits are created equal. What we're seeing is, in this region, cloud traffic will grow nine, nine and a half times over five years at a compounded annual growth rate of 57%. And even on mobile, in this region, 87% of the data going across mobile uh, services will be based in the cloud. And you know, I note that in the broadband plan, cloud is important. There's a key component for cloud. It's part of the goal. But when people talk about cloud, they never tell you what they mean. So what we've done is we've taken a look based upon a bottom-up <clears throat> concrete, what are some applications and what are the requirements from a network to support those applications. And we created three very over oversimplified baskets, basic, intermediate, and enhanced cloud applications. You know, and basic include things like downloading a tune from iTunes, some basic streaming. Um, when you get to intermediate, you begin to get in some business applications, some of the, the customer management, um, some file sharing, some of the voice over IP, IP telephony, a single HD video streaming. But the more interesting applications are in the advanced cloud basket. Some of the education and healthcare, the healthcare applications by the dis earlier today, the panel, were, were great. Those are the kinds of collaborative applications that require advanced, that are examples of advanced cloud. Industrial design, collaboration uh, in business, uh, researchers in different universities working together simultaneously on projects. And what you see is that. Um, if you have a basic cloud application, it doesn't require as much bandwidth as an intermediate or an advanced. It turns out, though, even more importantly is the network characteristic of latency. Latency for basic, you don't care. For an intermediate cloud application, you have to have latency end-to-end -end of less than 160 milliseconds. For advanced cloud, it's less than 100 milliseconds. But what's interesting, most of the cloud applications are not single cloud applications. You do more than one at a time. We talk about these as concurrent applications. And if you think about an advanced cloud application, you can get up to a requirement per collaborative session from the cloud of 20 megabits down, 10 megabits up, and latency of less than 100 milliseconds. That's a requirement, the, ne and the, the network, to, in order the network has to support that in order to have those applications work. Question, how is the network here doing? So we actually have network statistics. So here are the uh, GCC countries. Um, Qatar is sort of in the middle. Um, so the good news on the fixed speed network is that we're looking at about four meg down, 
one and a half meg up and latency of less than 100 milliseconds. So that can support maybe one advanced and one intermediate or two intermediate concurrent cloud apps. So it's a really good start. Green is the latency. But it's only a beginning, and this is where the types of investment that we heard about earlier this morning and why the broadband plan is so important in order to provide the types of applications going forward. On mobile, on the upload and download speed, we're doing pretty well. It's over six and a half meg down, two and a half meg up, but the latency will not support advanced cloud apps. Only the, net, only the mobile services in UAE will support advanced cloud apps. That will change with the migration to LTE, more spectrum. We have a lot of discussions earlier about spectrum. That's extremely important. And it's also about the, the configuration of the mobile services. I joke, some of you heard me make my joke. People talk about mobile networks. I have no idea what that means. In fact, I don't even think there is such a thing. Think about it. The network is not mobile. I am. My device is. The first thing that happens when the, when the radio link hits the tower, the base station, the antenna, it goes into a fixed network. And that's an architectural issue. Those networks have been designed in the past for voice. So I go a lot of hops, right? I finally get to the mobile switch. But if we're talking about data where we need low latency, you have to put that into the IP core right away. So. Summary and conclusion. We're going to have more users, and each user is using more bandwidth. Each user will have more devices and more powerful devices. Video in cloud is driving demand and consumption. Convergence is here. That's what this panel is about. This is not in the future. People have talked about it for a long time. It's done. It's here. We see it already. What are the implications? Advanced cloud apps are going to require advanced networks with low latency. We need more spectrum, licensed and unlicensed. We've talked about that. The plan talks about that. There's going to be a need for fiber for backhaul, middle mile, and aggregation. Networks are becoming heterogeneous. Macro cell outside, small cell Wi-Fi, Femto, indoors. 80% of the use of a mobile device is indoors and sitting down. It's all going to have to be, all going to have to be connected in the backhaul by fiber. Having the targets, 95% of households here have at least 100 meg down, 50 meg up, is extremely important to meet these goals on the fixed. Having a gigabit to every institution, government, education, healthcare, um, uh, is, a, is, is critical in order to meet these needs. The plan lays the groundwork for that, the targets and the goals. The other thing that's extremely important is that with this network fits for purpose, we have to recognize that broadband is multidimensional. All too often, the public discussions about broadband are one-dimensional. What's my nominal download speed? Do I have five, gigabit, five, five megabits down, you know, five mega, 10 mega, 100 megabits down, a gigabit down? That's not broadband. It's download, upload, latency, jitter, and some other characteristics. But the three critical ones, download, upload, latency. That's what gives you a network fit for purpose. And the plan addresses those needs, is looking at those trends and the drivers, and I think is a great place to start. So with that, what I would like to do is turn to um, the panelists for some reflections, some initial comments, and some reflections. Um, I'm going to just, for, for this round, I'm just going to move down this way. Um, uh, so, Nick, why don't we start with you from an Urdu perspective? Okay, great. Uh, thanks. So, just some reflections on the on the presentation there. I mean, there's no question that there's a huge uh, explosion in data happening. We actually think that it's going to be even more than what you said, at least for Qatar. Maybe for the region, that that's about right. But um, yeah, we're, we're seeing 70 to 100 percent growth in traffic year on year, and we have seen that for for a number of years, and that's very exciting for us. But I'm glad that you hit on the point of latency because latency is so, so important. 
And I can tell you, in my house today, we already have the 100 meg and 50 meg uh, within that house, but that doesn't solve everything for you because it's not just about the speed, about the sort of the fatness of the pipe and the speed of the pipe to your house, but it's also about the latency. And that, and that also comes down to where the content is. Where is it that you're trying to interact with? And even if you've got a very clear pipe all the way to America, um, with the way that HTTP uh, is designed today in the internet protocols, you will only ever get a 10 to 15 meg experience. So bringing that content closer to us, bringing that content to the region is the only way that you're going to get a really a sort of a hyper broadband experience. And so latency is absolutely critical and, uh, and very few people ever talk about that. So I'm glad that you, uh, that you highlighted that. Thanks, Dick. That leads directly to Al Jazeera with local content. Yep, I'd like to uh, reflect a little bit on the presentation and the uh, next point, adding on this, uh, uh, seeing that Al Jazeera operates in, in, in uh, If you could the pull middle. the microphone a little bit closer to you. Yeah, you don't have to move, uh, you move the microphone. Yeah. Seeing that Al Jazeera operates in the Middle East and North Africa, we're not seeing this explosion of uh, data only in Qatar or uh, GCC region. We are seeing this explosion also in, um, uh, in the Middle East uh, in general. I understand the penetration of mobile broadband in the Middle East is not uh, uh, comparable with GCC, but um, the data and the analytics that we have from uh, our OTT and the digital media activities that we have done, we have seen a huge growth in, in, uh, in the demand for data uh, over the top, and, and this adds on to the uh, capacity challenges that we, we, you guys have on the infrastructure side. Thank you. Jay. Uh, Robert, some amazing statistics here. I think the one that stands out. A little out, closer. <laughs> the one that stands out is the prime time, right? Because this has huge implications on media. Uh, television has been the prime time, and I think it's going to continue to coexist with online. And this has some implications on every aspect of media. I think it's all about integration of, of both experiences. So, from a content uh, producer standpoint, is like how do I engage the audience? more while he's watching my content on TV. And that's a, that's a quite important challenge for content producers. From broadcasters or for distributors, uh, the challenge is more around, you know, how can you be the single source or the single provider of video services? Right now, the game is quite fragmented. And the data that you show shows that it's going to be far, it's going to, the fragmentation is only going to increase. So, you know, a very recent survey on OTT video, majority of the survey respondents who are users of content said that uh, we would prefer a single source provider that transcends all different aspects of television, online, tablet, mobile, video. And that puts a, a very important sort of challenge for the distributors. Uh, even for advertisers, we always talk about, you know, you see an ad in television and very quickly the same ad is repeated on online. And that has a huge impact on what that ad can do or deliver to, to, to your influence. And, uh, and that's a challenge for the advertising community. So I think the data that you showed has very serious implications. And as you mentioned, it's now. It's not in the future. Thank you. Marcin, this is a great lead to Marcin, that you actually look at consumer behavior. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, for us, as an effective measure, we're basically um, more into the analysis of the consumer behavior on online so that we understand the people, what they are doing online, how they are consuming different websites, and their profiles, which is the most important part, because we're using, with, we're dealing with the human interaction at the end on the internet. I mean, the key point here is the um, for the QNB is the conversion, and the conversion will happen through creating a local content which is relevant to the region. Because um, I, I want to share with you, I came up through a study which is it says that only three percent of the um, internet content is is in Arabic language, which is a very scary number because, I mean, if we are in this region and we are creating a plans that will encourage the convergence and uh, so that we can create more local contents relevant to the local market, which is really important at this point. And uh, that's how can we see it. And that's how we fill the gap through analyzing this, da this data, how it is uh, creating this convergence and how this content is enriching the whole market. I mean, that part. Thank you. Raheem. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yes, great statistics, in fact, and uh, from a technology perspective, in fact, we, we do agree, in fact, because talking to our customers, we do see them uh, reflecting on these figures, and they saw, of course, all this, you know, explosion of data, but also video. 
and a lot of, to a lot of you know, um, people in the industry, the question is, is it the end of TV as we know today? So the point is, I, I think TV is still there, but the point is the environment around TV is changing. I think you know, uh, we're moving from linear TV where everyone is watching the same thing to on demand where even within the same house, you, know, you, will, you will have maybe within the same family, uh, members of the same family watching different things on different devices. So this is a multi-screen, and this is, of course, putting a lot of pressure on the networks. And as you mentioned rightfully, uh, the delay and the latency and all these issues, of course, the operators are confronted with these issues. Now, um, we have looked at this as well from, from the impact, and we saw you know, the proliferation of the video, but also the move to the cloud has a big impact on network architecture for, for, uh, for the telcos. And this is basically, uh, we have done a study to extend it to uh, the next step to look what's the impact on the architecture of the telcos. We looked at the real uh, reference architecture of the service provider as a convergent service provider. We looked at the pattern of traffic and the next five years, and we saw that basically the uh, TV and IPTV architecture is shifting. We, we used to have, let's say, a, sort of a central office, a head end, and then we try to optimize the, the distribution of the video to uh, the, resi the residential users. And today, actually, we're trying to distribute this architecture. Uh, we saw through the study that actually the traffic in the next five years will be basically increasing in the metro cities by 570% in the next five years, which means, in fact, that there's a need to push and to get closer to the customer to distribute this from a central uh, architecture to a distributed architecture, distributed data centers, distributed CDN, and so on. So there's also a huge impact on the architecture, and I think the telcos are faced with the challenge of making this big value of, of the network, of ensuring that between both ends, the devices and the handheld devices and the uh, huge data centers, Somewhere there needs to be very minimum latency and uh, very good quality of service, especially for video. Thank you. And Brahim, you make a really good point, which is, um, uh, and we've shared the data as well, <clears throat> that uh, metro and access traffic is growing significantly faster than the uh, global core backhaul traffic. And the reason is because it's video that's being pushed and then cached locally, and then CDN's uh, content delivery networks are being used uh, in the local delivery area. So that's more evidence that video is driving the consumption model, right? And it happens to be video that peop more, more than one person watches, right? Because you only get those advantages of local caching uh, and the growth of metro versus backhaul when lots of people are watching the same video. Right? And that goes to also to your point about reducing latency, which is you know, maybe helping Nick get better video at home uh, and then having it be, be the local content. So um, thank you for raising that because that's exactly uh, you know, some of the additional uh, data we agree completely on. Renee, from, a, from Ericsson's perspective, especially because you're in this mobile world, well, I would like to pick up on the video data you talked about, and I think it clearly points to one thing, and that is that uh, it's good to have a national broadband plan, and the first generation of broadband plans typically were about rolling out infrastructure. I think what video data says, that that's the key driver for mass market adoption of broadband. If you don't have that kind of uh, amount of content in, in, for broadband distribution, uh, it will be much harder to get a mass market adoption of high-speed broadband services. Secondly, I think the data shows one important observation, and that is that uh, this is the convergence phenomenon, watching at it, looking at it from a network point of view. That all data is coming from somewhere, and we never go behind the curves, uh, the forecasts, and I mean, they are very important, but what's behind those forecasts, and that is actually that there is a migration away from offline, that is physical, and from broadcasting, that is terrestrial and satellite networks. So there is a shift away of, of consumption from these one-way distribution platforms to, uh, to the IP world. And that has, I think, implication for the convergence uh, discussion from a policy point of view. One is that uh, uh, if we talk about converge regulation, I think we need to make sure that we are not putting the old broadcast regulatory models onto our broadband platforms and 
limiting them to just become another me broadcast distribution platform. And that is because the ultimate goal from a policy making point of view, why convergence matter is to get substitution and competition to happen between different uh, networks and devices and service providers. So the number one reason why convergence matters from a policy point of view is ultimately to drive these competitive forces that will drive innovation, choice, and price for consumers to choose between different platforms and devices. Thank you, Renee. I want to come back um, to, to your point about regulatory frameworks in a second, but if I could just uh, first, in terms of the questions, uh, turn to Jay. Um, you know, you're looking at the media landscape across the region, right? How do you see it evolving uh, in terms of both, you know, the media, the consumer, the behavior, the players? I mean, this is what you do. Sure. I think uh, digitization in general is, uh, is a good thing for media because at the end of it, the amount of time that an individual or a consumer in the Middle East is spending on media is increasing. So it's not, uh, you know, online video or mobile video is coming at the cost of television. It's actually all of the, of the below, every uh, aspect is increasing. Uh, globally, four per, there's a 4% increase year on year in amount of time that people spend in media. And we are seeing a similar evolution uh, in the GCC and in the Middle East uh, more broadly. Uh, so back to uh, Ibrahim's point, TV uh, is the dominating, dominating video consumption platform today. And it will continue to remain a mainstream sort of uh, focus. I think uh, what your data is uh, suggesting is that there will be a lot of integration of that television experience with lots of other uh, online uh, and mobile video. And this would happen a lot to do with multitasking. So from a behavior perspective, we will see a lot of media snacking, which is, you know, uh, you're consuming on different forms, different content, which is somehow, somehow related. So you may be watching a reality show on television, but you're using all sorts of gadgets to interact with what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, and that's going to drive a lot of how, the, how the, the media is being consumed. I think social networks also are playing an important role. So you, know, you talk about uh, disruptive models uh, globally and in developed markets. We don't, we're not seeing a lot of disruptive models or disruption happening in video in the Middle East. Where it's happening is on social network. I think there is a high percentage of the population and growing every, every day that's going on social networks. And social networks are actually becoming the town squares in the Middle East, where everyone's participating. Uh, it's not only the youth, it's not only the digital generation, but it's also the middle-aged uh, people and somewhat even the senior citizens who are coming on that. Because what distinguishes Middle East is the family ties. 62% of people who are in the age group of 15 to 35 actually live in extended families. And there is a by sort of generational exchange of ideas, values, but also technology. So you don't see the, the use of technology habits very different in a middle-aged person as opposed to a digital generation here in the Middle East. So you see that, you know, town squares, everyone's on it. And I think that's where the disruption is, uh, which is more affecting if you may print media or news, because social media is now uh, becoming the primary source or the first source of news content for, for many of the, of the younger and the digital generation. And that's how they're growing up with news. So I think that's where the disruption is. Video is going to be a more integrated experience, and the players who can integrate it faster uh, are going to be the ones who are going to be uh, coming out the winners. And I think broadcasters and, uh, and telecom operators have that sort of advantage uh, in the Middle East compared to pure OTT players that you see in the developed world. And that's because you know, the predominant form of distribution of television content in the region broadly continues to be free-to-air satellite, and that will coexist as we move in the future. Thank you, Jay. And actually, that leads very nicely into Marzen, you know, yes. looking at consumer behavior, consumer consumption broadly. Yes. Basically, um, I want to go back to the same point, which is related to the content. I mean, we have realized the MENA consumption in the terms of digital. Most of the time, people, they are spending time on the search engines. So basically, spending time on search engines, it means people, they are searching for a lot of content. And that's why here the convergence plays an important role for providing this content to the, uh, to the online users in the MENA region so that it can cater and fills this gap that, as I said from the beginning about the Arabic language, 
And also, if you want to talk more about the e-commerce scene in the market, I mean, uh, we have realized that only 9% of the brands and retailers, they have an online presence, which is this thing, it should be changed by time because as I said, like when you are searching for content, you need to be reached online. And that's very important in that part for the conversions. Only 9%. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's basically how do we see it. And um, of course, the social media network and the video, as you said, is the next big thing. Or it's, it is the big thing right now. And the behavior of the online, which is more shifting towards the mobile and the connected devices all the time, like you were mentioning about the TV, when we are watching a TV where we're using our, our mobile phone or we are interacting with a certain show, for example, like X Factor or whatever. So basically, the online behavior is moving towards the mobile devices as well. Um, so that's pretty much how we, can, how we see it, actually. So, Mohammed. Hearing this about the behavior, how does that affect or you think about the Al Jazeera business model? I mean, you're a new media guy, right? Yeah. So what are you thinking about going forward? How does that change the business model? Yeah. Um, I'd like you have to, a really global footprint. Yeah. I think uh, touching a little bit on the point of the gentleman here, uh, because I come from the pay TV part of the Al Jazeera, which is Al Jazeera Sport, and we are seeing a huge shift in the way that people are uh, consuming our content. Uh, the, the, the emergence of uh, second screen apps, um, we, have, um, we have experience with that in, in Europe, especially in one of our subsidiaries. We have seen that 50% of our subscribers are using or consuming our sporting uh, premium content while also uh, interacting with, uh, with, uh, with second screen. So uh, I think the demand is not going to come entirely only from OTT, but also it's going to come from the way that people are experiencing uh, the content nowadays. Uh, people are watching TV, but at the same time, they have their iPads, they have their mobile phones, they are interacting and they are um, uh, uh, consuming the, the or cons using the, this content to, um, uh, to, to drive some of the second experience uh, apps that they are using at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Renee, could I ask you to maybe, we're talking about some of these major shifts in consumer behavior, industry, structure, technology, disruption. But we're living in a world of legacy policy and regulation. And I know that you've thought about that, and you have a great way to think about that. Could you sort of raise, you know, some one of what, what, how you think about this and what some of the big policy issues are? Yeah, yes, thank you. And if we can get the slide up, uh, this is actually one slide that is uh, capturing. Uh, we have looked in as a company into about 30 countries, different convergence reviews that have happened ar uh, around the world. I personally have been talking to this slide all the way from uh, New Zealand to Uruguay. So it's been traveling some places and I've received a lot of feedback. But ultimately, if I can come back to the first speaker about saying, uh, the government will gain the most if you let the industry to compete. This is my point I'm trying to make. If we want to maximize the economic impact in terms of driving innovation, choice, and competition, we should make sure that the uh, converged media landscape is regulated in such a way that it stimulates maximum competition between different platforms. This means that we don't have to, and we have looked at different countries, lose control of how content is regulated, but we have to look from an economic point of view how access to content can be increased. And that comes from increased production subsidies, if that's necessary in some parts of the world, that has to do with, with competition between platforms, that has to do with copyright and other broadcast regulation that needs to be updated. The worst thing that can happen is to retrofit other countries' old uh, technology-specific regulatory models and make a broadband platform just a me-too broadcast distribution. That's the worst outcome that can happen from a policy point of view. Thank you, Rene. Um, that leads very nicely into you know, Nick for Urdu in this world. 
you know, how are you addressing this world of over the top content, other content? What are some of the things that you see both from a network investment perspective, but also some of these policy and legacy policy questions that, that Renee raises? Okay, so um, yeah, a, a few angles there. I think when, when people talk about OTT, that, that, can be, um, that can mean very many different things. Sometimes they're really meaning Google, Skype, and those likes. Other times they're meaning the technology. But frankly, we love OTT both as a technology and we love those players there as, as well. Um, and when we think about this, it's both very exciting but also very scary as well. The scary bit is, if you look at your P&L today, 80% of our revenues that we have today, and probably at least as much of our profits, simply will not exist in 2020. Um, and that is the scary bit. You know, if I go to Korea today and say, how much do you pay for an SMS? They say, what are you talking about? Yeah. They don't pay for that. If I go there in two years from now and say, how much do you pay for a telephone call? They won't know what you're talking about. So the model is changing uh, dramatically. And that's even through the, tradi the, uh, the traditional ways. But what is exciting is those, the, the broadband and the data growth. You know, if any of you were starting up a business and I said to you, look, demand for your product is going to grow by 50 to 100% per year for the next 10 years. You know, is that a good business or not? You think that's a fantastic business. And then on top of that, there's all these opportunities for you to partner and get into other industries. You know, would you like to start up a business like that? Yeah, absolutely. The challenge the industry has got is one of complete transformation and, and pricing and, and, and so forth. That, that's the real issue. There's no shortage of demand for services, and you really have to innovate. So if I take our media business as an example, we're one of the longest established media players and pay TV pr uh, providers in Qatar. Started uh, years back, and I think uh, Hashem, who's in, in the audience here, was one of the, uh, the founders of this and a very successful business. Um, but then, then the satellite providers were, uh, uh, came in, and we went from 100% market share down to 5%. But then after that, and Hashem started this off, we then had to innovate, and we had to put in place new, new services, new products. And today, our media service, which happens to be over IPTV currently, it has the on-demand, it has the catch-up TV, it has the high definition, it has the a la carte packages, and we're back up to the number one um, pay TV provider. We partner with Al Jazeera, so you know, we sell a lot of Al Jazeera sport through our network and, and we've got a very uh, good partnership there. And you just have to innovate and change your business model. You have to keep up with technology, but most importantly, you've got to keep your eye on what the customer wants and what, and what they need. So that's what we, we think about. But you know, what we, in that environment, regulation has to change uh, you know, tremendously as well. And so you, know, you need to forget about what the price per SMS, the price per voice call is, because in five years from now, that's not even going to exist. Um, but when we were talking about latency and so forth before, and how do we get that broadband service? How do we get the content close to here? And then talking about things like, uh, we haven't talked about privacy yet, but privacy is critical. Um, and then on top of that, uh, things about the copyright uh, and, and so forth, and IP protection is absolutely critical about fueling this broadband environment. So I think you know, when we talked earlier about uh, to where the, the, the football and actually where the ball is going, um, and that's where, really where we need to be focused. So we think a lot about that, and that's what I have to do, start up all these, these new businesses. We, we love OTT. We, we love all of this. We're well over the fact that you know, we don't say these guys are e eating a lunch. Maybe they are, but my lunch was a small sandwich. Now it's a big buffet, um, and we just gotta, we've just got to get in there. And, um, and we're very excited about the future. Thank you. Um, you raised poli a lot of the uh, policy questions. I know, Brahim, that you know, you've looked at the broadband plan, the policy, regulatory proposals, but you also work across the entire Middle East and Africa, and you see the wide range of policy issues and, and what different countries are doing. So, wh wh what do you see? And linking back, again back from the plan to what you've heard on the panel so far, of uh, what needs to be done? What are the priorities to enable yeah. these things to grow? Yeah, 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 I think I think uh, what's happening is is the same questions have been raised by other, of course, service providers uh, in the region in the sense that they see the decline in revenue and they see the risk of decline in, in revenue, especially in voice and SMS and uh, and messaging. <coughs> while at the same time they see the increase in video and data traffic. So so of course the, the question here is the pressure on the investment on the network infrastructure, and basically in the long term, a lot of people are asking the question: Is this a, a sustainable uh, model in the long? run and the question is how uh, how to create a balance between basically who invests in the infrastructure but also who captures value 
of course, in this end-to-end uh, -end value chain. So this main question is, is basically raising concerns about how to rethink the regulation and policy as part of, you know, uh, you know uh, new broadband plans and, and things like that. And, and the point is here is, is basically how, at the same time, not to... Uh, uh, how to preserve openness and how to pre preserve a non-discriminatory uh, rules while putting in place a, a broadband plan. Of course, people are saying the internet has emerged and uh, in, thanks to its openness, this open model that's non-regulated has created its success, but at the same time, they are saying, uh, some argue that, okay, the broadcasters and the telco telcos are, open, are, subject, uh, are subject to regulations on the point is how to rethink this, this, uh, this basically, and how to allow, for example, telcos to monetize their network infrastructures, how basically they can leverage on, on the traffic to differentiate traffic thanks to quality of service, because this is the demand of the end users. They ask for more uh, valued, more and better quality of service, differentiated services, and the question from telcos is how to differentiate, how to monetize these differentiated services. Now, th this is, by the way, the big question facing service providers globally. I mean, the, the, you know, Nick has talked about, you know, sucking it up and basically saying the old world of voice is the old world, right? And we're trying to figure out what the new world is. In fact, the way I think about it is there, you know, are five key assumptions that have governed the telephone, the traditional telephone industry f for 85 years, 90 years. The first assumption is the product is voice. The second assumption is that the metric by which you measure it, regulate it, and bill it is the minute, right? There are, sort of going back to first economic principles, um, uh, marginal cost differences with how long you talk, right? The longer you talk, the more you charge. Um, the distance over which you've connected affects the cost, and then where you're located can affect the cost. Well, in a world of a flat IP network, you're either on or off. The product isn't voice, it's connectivity. The metric isn't minutes, it's bandwidth, right? And the networks are distance, time, and location insensitive. You're buying it in chunks, right? You're, you've got a broadband connection for a certain amount of bandwidth, right? If that's the case, but most of the revenue today in the industry is still coming from charging for minutes of voice, we know where, we're gonna, where we need to be. How do we make that transition? And by the way, it's not two years away in Korea. My local plan now in the U.S., my mobile service is AT&T. I get to connect five devices. It's a data plan, right? It's a data plan. I can connect five devices to the data to, for the plan on the same package, and they tell me, don't worry about voice. Voice is free, right? Text, we don't care. So it's, it's already happening. The question is, how do we actually, how do we find the, the, the new business model that will do two, uh, multiple things, but at least two, right? Still result in the investment in the networks that we need, because without that, nothing's gonna happen, right? And then number two, create the right business case for the market and revenue to grow for both operators and content providers um, and grow the pie, as you say, into the buffet. Um, yeah. So it's a really interesting question. I don't think we really have nailed the answer yet. But what I'd like to do, and I know this may sound radical, is I would like to turn to the audience to see if you have questions before we go to another round up here. Um, and I think there's supposed to be a microphone someplace there running to get it because we haven't needed it yet. Um, are there any questions? There's a question. Let me see how many there are. So if you raise your hand, we'll take a couple of questions or we just have the one up. Uh, one back here, one over here. And so let's take both questions, and then, is that a one or a 10? 10, 10, okay, that's what I thought. Um, okay, so let's do both questions, and then we'll, then we'll have the answers, and then we'll see if there are more questions. If not, I have a whole bunch more. Okay, please. Yeah, uh, I, my name is Amjad Afifi. Uh, I'm from Center of, so, uh, for GIS. Uh, but I'm asking as a normal user, okay? For me, as a, as a home user for brand, broadband, I keep thinking, why can't I have my web page on, at home? This I'm talking about content. We are talking about content. In order to uh, 
one of the uh, key factors for the broadband success is content. So I believe that by enabling normal users to have to host their web uh, site at home, this can increase the content dramatically. Yes. Okay, thank you. So the question is, what about hosting content at home, yeah. not just your web page, but other content at home? Interestingly, of course, if you go to YouTube and upload video from your mobile phone, in some ways that's at least generating, if not hosting. But yeah, so we'll come back. Uh, the other question was over here. Mohamed um, Jazar with the Qatar University. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for this opportunity. Um, my question is um, more of an academic uh, nature. In the old days, you used to talk about OSI model versus IP model. The IP model won by, you know, just being practical. I wonder if there's a new, a new technology that could handle or tackle this problem of latency and other problems as well that are technological other than IP. I know there's a lot of research in this area, but can you expand or do you, do you know of anything that could be eminent or could be, um, you know, that would help in this, in this regard? All right, so the question is, are there other ways to deal with latency or capacity constraints perhaps? All right, so we have a question, a technology question about latency, and we have a, a question, I'm not sure whether it's a technical or business model or whatever, why can't I host from home? Um, Rene, please. Well, I can ask maybe from a policy point of view, and I think this is a very good example when copyright and uh, ICT meets. And in, in countries where you don't provide uh, provisions and immunities to those who host and cache content uh, in somewhere close to the network, uh, to the user, sorry, uh, it's, it comes with a risk because you can, be, uh, you can face injunctions and you can face liability for third party infringements. So one important role of copywriters, of course, is to create, create conditional immunities, as though we have in DMCA or in the European copyright law that you can actually safely, as an intermediary, uh, cache content locally. And that will, of course, improve the performance of the, of the experience of, 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 of the end user without actually requiring additional investments. Anybody want to uh, answer the question about the... Um uh, home caching or the, ho the, the, the hosting your website at home? They, they, yeah, well, I mean, they, can that I, be done already? I now? think, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it can be done uh, already, and I think I'm yeah, very happy for anyone that wants to do that. I think my observation on the trend of, of how people are managing their home IT is it's actually going more to the cloud rather than in, in the home uh, due to the cost uh, and actually the reliability of that. You know, the amount of hard drives that have been smashed and so forth in my house is quite high. And uh, I've lost quite a bit of content, but uh, uh, you know whether that's uh, Redo or Amazon or so forth, they tend to lose much less of it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, from that side. And then just on the, the other one, the, the IP question. So there is a new version of, uh, of uh, HTTP uh, under development, and the way that various protocols across the internet uh, uh, work. Um, my understanding is that it's going to be about 2017 before that starts to become uh, uh, you know, widespread. I think some of the more immediate problems are the IPv6 and getting that more broadly adopted so there's just enough addresses for this explosion of devices to talk to each other. Um, but yeah, there, there are new protocols which are emerging. Um, I'm not a deep engineering technologist, but um, I know that there will be much more efficient communication between packets to enable so, uh, some of this, and that is a, uh, certainly a hot topic among the broader industry. Um, and again, to your question about the hosting, um, uh, you know, most business now is moving away from doing their own hosting and moving into cloud hosting. Uh, a question from Khalid. Um, Stand up and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Khalid. I'm from Nextven. Actually, it's uh, something that I've heard it in the uh, telecom world in Bangkok. It was uh, a special program about uh, an experience that uh, the Malaysia Telecom uh, have uh, shown, showcased in the, uh, in the conference, where they did this connected at the root uh, initiative. So um, I'm happy to hear about the uh, broadband plan because this creates the, the environment and the framework and enables everybody to compete and increase the capability of the different players to, to play in the market and create. 
But what I'm suggesting here is something to look into the social side of the story, because this where the regulator uh, or the government needs to fill a bit the gap, I'll use, borrow your term, to, to try to enable that. So this little family that we have seen in the video there, that was uh, able to create a whole industry around just a small connection that they had, is, is a great story. And I think repeating such a stories will fill this gap between the beautiful discussions that we are having here and also some layers in the society that really needs this uh, technology to enable them to enhance their life and create a real impact on the society level. It's just a recommendation. Thank you. So we have about three minutes left and I do want to come back to the panel with at least one thing and that is, you know, both Blair and Richard talked about the importance of execution, right, and what's needed. Um, a number of people have raised copyright or intellectual property questions. Um, is copyright an issue for this region? I mean, for example, this is Al Jazeera. I mean, this is, you know, you're facing this all the time in yes. terms of copyright protection, but getting the balance between protection and liability. What's needed, if anything? I think this is, uh, this is a very important question. I think uh, we in Al Jazeera Sport, we, uh, we suffer from the challenges uh, to, uh, with the piracy, you know, of our signals. When you diversify and you go into different platforms and you open up your content to different technologies and different platforms, uh, you get exposed. And, and, uh, and since we are in the business of uh, premium content and distribution of premium content, uh, it's very difficult for us to, it's very important actually for us to think about security and you know, uh, how to secure our, uh, our uh, premium content. And I think this moving forward in the future, this will be a major concern for us. Uh, once we go uh, develop more and more uh, digital products and, uh, and uh, that can be consumed on uh, anywhere and on every device. Possible. There's a question, uh, of course, of some of these intermediate liability questions. And I don't know whether that's something that Urdu is facing or not in this region, um, or is copyright not an issue? Uh, no, the, for us, we. We haven't had so, so much of an issue about it, but I've got a couple of reflections on, on the copyright. We, we don't have a problem partnering with content partners and caching the, the content uh, with, um, with us because we're, we're very stringent on the security and the DRM and so forth so that people can feel confident with that. But if you can move to a broader hosting business, uh, I think there are two main concerns, which is if I, if I as a company want to host my content in, in, in the region, is it secure? And what happens if someone does copy it or, or, or knock it off? Do I, what recourse do I have? And if the answer is none, then, then for sure they're not going to go there. Uh, and the other one is actually security. Now that people know a little bit more about what the NSA is doing, um, they may have got some different views on that. But in the past, they were all very paranoid that having uh, their data in this part of the world or anywhere else, it would be snooped upon and, look, uh, and people would have rights to look into it. I think now they're seeing that Wherever it is, people are looking into it. So maybe attitudes will change. I'm not sure how that will go. But, but the, um, yeah, I'll give you an observation of the financial services industry. There was places like Switzerland, very small place that's built up a huge industry based around security, privacy, and great trust. And there's no reason why you can't do that in the digital space as well. And so I think with the right legislation and the right environment, you could find very attractive ways uh, which are non-threatening to people coming out there. Last observation from the consumer perspective is that most people don't want to be criminals. They, they don't want to download stuff illegally, but if they can't have access to the service at a reasonable price to meet their needs, then they will find other ways to meet their needs. And so I think it's incumbent upon the industry also to find ways to deliver the services at the prices that's affordable to, to most. And then, uh, and then you've got much less of an issue around piracy and so forth. Well, that was Apple's insight with iTunes. People Absolutely. were willing to pay a reasonable price. Brahim, you'll have the last word. Yeah, actually on this, actually, it's, it's interesting because, uh, for example, in North Africa, where I've talked to sev several service providers, they suffer a lot from the piracy because uh, the only way for them to, uh, to, to uh, promote the fixed, at least the ADSL, the wireline subscriptions, is basically to promote services such as IPTV. And all of them basically are saying we suffer we, don't, we cannot have the wireline or the ADSL take off. The regulator doesn't know what to do because they're saying, okay, we put all the conditions for the unbundling, but it's not working. So at the same time, they're promoting aggressive uh, mobile broadband. So basically, uh, you know, in Europe, we know, for example, in France, what helped ADSL take off is, of course, to have the bundling and to have the IPTV as part of the story, the voice, the internet. 
But in, in North Africa, for example, they're saying, what can we do? Um, you know, people will do internet with the mobile, with the dongle, so they don't see value in having just simple internet. If I cannot find a way, basically, to overcome this hurdle of piracy, of, and then being able to launch some attractive services to be and such as, as IPTV. So it's, in fact, it has a, a quite substantial impact on the business of the wireline, at least in North Africa, some parts of the world. Thank you, Brian. Actually, Rene will have the last word because you, you, you stimulated something in Rene, then we're going to have to run out of time a lot to close. Rene, go ahead. I think the point I'm trying to make is also captured in the plan, and that is that to get uh, economic impact from, uh, from broadband plan, we need to have both supply side and demand side policies in place. Uh, I think one important observation is that the first generation broadband plans from mature economies focus very much on rollout of broadband, not, not very much on adoption. I think that's a very important observation to take into account that uh, adoption of high-speed broadband uh, and what kind of adoption we have, of course, will ultimately lead to uh, the economic impact. And in that context, uh, uh, when it comes to stimulating mass adoption of high-speed broadband, content is key uh, for the mass market. I'm not saying it's for every segment, but for the mass market it is. Uh, in every country where we looked uh, to, when there is a market offer of providing attractive digital lawful content, it can compete with free. Piracy is typically a problem of a market supply failure when legitimate lawful alternatives are dear and far away. If you can create a conducive environment from a policy point of view that you can stimulate lawful digital access and local content, it will drive the adoption of broadband and it will drive the media interest as well. Thank you very much. And again, um, this was a, a, a great panel. I learned a lot. Um, I want to thank Dr. Hesse for the opportunity this afternoon to be here uh, and again to congratulate ICT Cutter for uh, the plan. And I want to very much thank the panel for a great discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.